Hey there, since Flowable 3.12 is released, I would like to know what's new in this version. That's the reason why I invited Joram Barris from the product team to join me for this video. Joram, what do you think is the most important takeaway for the 3.12 release? Oh, that's already a difficult question. Uh, 3.12 really is a big release. There is something in there for everybody from low level technical interfaces, hook points, to new form widgets, case view enhancements, really hard to pick and select you know my favorite ones so to say what would you recommend everybody watching this video well that question is easy you go to flowable.com find the download trial button and just you know get going with the trial and actually feel the whole thing that we're showing today for yourself with which topic would you like to get started today so I selected the events and channels as a first topic, not because it's the most important thing in 3.12, uh, but because we invested quite a bit of engineering time in this particular area. The reason for that is logical. We have a lot of customers that are using the events and channels under high performance, high load, high throughput scenarios. And there's a lot of things in 3.12 that make it even better than before. Considering the event registry, it was always difficult to test events with Flowable Inspect. What kind of improvements do we have around that? That's a very good question, Valentin. Indeed, that's feedback we gather from many customers and we've listened to it. Uh, you'll be happy to see that what I'm going to show you now. So what I have right now is a Flowable 312 trial download already booted up and I created a simple demo application that has a simple BPMN process, the order process, classic. Um, you know, comes in with uh, with an event, a message on a Kafka topic. Uh, let me just quickly show you the channel. So I've okay. got an incoming so order yes. channel. Starting that one based on an event with a channel which yeah. is coming from yeah, Kafka. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I've got an event here, right? And mm -hmm. then the the channel. You might wonder why I didn't bound it here to a channel. Um, technically, there is not really a reason to. It is a best yeah. practice though to do it which I didn't do, of course, uh, but it's good metadata to link it anyway. But technically, the only thing that matters is the key of the event mm -hmm. coming in. And that can come to various different channels even. Yeah. In this particular setup, I configured it to listen to a Kafka inbound mm -hmm. channel that is configured to an incoming orders topic. Uh, the event that comes in looks like this. You know, It's nothing too special. It has an ID, which I use to correlate uh, on the instance level. It has a product name and a price. Once the so instance is started. Just three simple fields. And then you are using yep. also the product name actually in the first task. Yep, exactly. Well spotted here. So I actually used an expression here to just show something different in the UI. Uh, once I am at that particular user task, I am listening here on the boundary mm -hmm. again to a Kafka inbound channel with a different event okay. this time. Um, it has an ID similar as before and a reason. And the, the channel is actually just another okay. Kafka inbound channel. So it's not the same channel that to keep no. the event key detection simple with a fix. Uh, exactly, just for, for demo purposes. Otherwise I would have to configure it in a more complex way. But now I've got two separate topics and they both receive different types of events. So quite simple. Uh, let me show you how that looks like at runtime. I've already deployed it to a Flubble work instance and I already have inspect open. now. If you've used 3.11 or older, you might immediately spot the difference here. There is a new tab, Event mm -hmm. Channels. Uh, the Event Channels basically gives you a system-wide overview of all the channels in your system. And because this is a simple demo, I only have two, the incoming one and the cancel one. And I can click mm -hmm. it. Here I can click so it and I basically see it's... you also have a send button at the top. What is the yeah. difference <laughs> well between spotted. that mail and that button? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. So basically here, it already introspects what I selected in the list, right? Channel event, because I only have one pre-selected. And it introspects the event uh, definition, the event model, and pre-populates this in a form. If I would go here, it's a more generic, you know, selected here, channel go down, mm -hmm. and more top-down selection instead of the list. It's just, you know, a different way, a bit of convenience here. If I click this uh, icon immediately, which I'm going to do now. So... I need an ID. I'm going to use one, two, three, four, five. Product name is a laptop. The price is one, two, three, four, just some random data. So if I press this, this will now actually send it into Flowable Work and it will start a new instance if all things went well. All right, here we go. There it is. The cool thing is that this is not 
passing any Kafka installation. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is, I can just test this on my local machine without having to install Kafka, actually. I just test drive that my model is working through Inspect. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that if I now go into Inspect, you can actually see that we're now at the review order task step, right? Which is also mm -hmm. shown on the screen here. And in the event registry tab here, I can oh. see it's now actually waiting on the cancellation event to come in. It means you see Again, there are basically all the events where this waiting on right now. Correct. So in case correct. you have multiple, you would also see multiple in that list. That is correct. If you have multiple in your instance, they would be shown here. And you can basically trigger them from this UI. Uh, mm -hmm. So if I do this again, similar as before, it will introspect the event model and populate or show a form for me to fill in the event payload, basically. Yeah. Um, so I did and one, two, three. Here four, we five. actually also see that there's no channel associated and it's directly going ahead and correct. sending it to correct. the engine. Correct, correct, correct. Yes, yes. This is all without, so this through Inspect really allows you to test drive your model without having to worry about complex setup, Kafka topics, cleaning up the data and all such sort of things really allows you to focus on modeling and making sure that your model works, your mm -hmm. instance behaves as you would expect. So let me try that. Let's press the OK button. Let me just go back quickly, back and forth. And you can see that indeed, we're, we've now moved from this event here on the boundary into the cancellation step of the uh, instance. So that's in a nutshell how we can use the new 312 inspect features for channels and events. That's really cool. That shows us basically how we can test our models with the event registry together with global inspect. Thank you, Johan. Yeah, no worries. I think this is going to be a feature that many customers will appreciate and use a lot in their daily work. Johan, you mentioned at the beginning that there are a lot of improvements around Kafka. And I have heard that there's mm -hmm. something around the header and the full message payload from the message as well. What yeah, are the yeah, news yeah, there? that's correct. Yeah, so let me just quickly show you. I think that's the easiest. So let me open up any of the events we have. Um, and basically, when you open up any field or create uh, another field to the event, there's a couple of new options in 3.12. For example, the header, you can check it here. What this technically means is that this value is not coming from the payload, but actually is transported through the header of the message. And this is quite a common pattern that we've seen at many customers. And so it's important to grasp that. Now, crucial to this is that in the model, in the BP man and Sigma model, this information is not really exposed because as a modeler, you don't care where the value is coming from, payload or header. You just work with the data from the event. But technically, this makes a big difference. Similarly, there is also the full payload. What we found is that customers have asked to map the full payload of the event into one field and then continue working with it in their model. So this is really a technical way to capture different ways of working with, with data coming from Kafka. So you mentioned before that this is not inside the BPMN or CMMN model. With that, it is Correct. happening during the channel processing. And you yeah. would be even able to adapt it there when you use, for example, your own implementations. Yeah, actually, the interfaces that we have there, the pluggability points, uh, they have been enhanced to have these new parameters where you can actually see now the difference between regular payload data and data that comes from another place, for example, the headers. Yeah, it's a good question, indeed. That, that makes sense. Now, previously, I have had issues when my message fails during the processing. For example, yeah. I did something wrong in my model, and it had an exception, and then Kafka was stuck at this message. Is there anything right. new around that one as well? There is actually, that's, uh, there is a new retry mechanism that we've added and also a dead letter mechanism similar. I mean, a dead letter concept comes from many other messaging systems. If you can't process a message after a couple of retries, you move that yeah. message to a dead letter topic. So let me and show you how that looks like. That's on the channel then, I guess. Since Correct, yeah, itself, exactly. It so make sense. Exactly, you configure this on the channel. Now, there's a lot of things you can configure here. I mean, I'm not even going to go into this. Um, there is documentation around this which explains this all in detail. But what's important here to understand is that Kafka, basically, uh, you're consuming messages from Kafka, you know, on and on and on. Uh, 
And Kafka does not have a way to say, okay, I want to retry this method. So you're going to block all the other consumers of the same partition and the same topic. So what we do behind the scenes, and we uh, use Spring Kafka for this, is we actually move the message to another topic, to a retry topic. And depending on configuration, you can have one, two, tens of retry topics with, with various delays and all kinds of you know, configurations to basically free up that first topic, those first you know, partitions on those topics where you're listening to. And those consumers should speed up, even if one of them mm -hmm. is going into an exception. If that retries, if the retries have been tried as many times as you configured, the message is then moved into a dead letter topic on the Kafka side. And then basically it's up to you to configure what you want to do. Um, you might want to configure a new process, for example, that listens mm -hmm. to these new dead letter messages and handle them in you know the exception way. That that means I can even go ahead and model whatever I want. For the exception cases as well, with a yes, same low code exactly. version than before. That's yep, your really imagination cool. is the limitation, basically. Then, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That is really cool. Now, um, how is it about scaling? You mentioned something right. about multiple nodes. So, how does that work now with the new version, and what kind of improvements do yeah. we have there? Yeah, yeah. All right. So basically, uh, what we've done, and we've, we've uh, this is quite a bit of engineering work we've we've spent onto this, is we've seen that many people use Flowable in various you know setups. One of them being you know high throughput microservice orchestrations, um, and not necessarily all the Flowable instances share the same database. They have specific one you know one database in Kubernetes, for example. You boot up a whole set of, of services that belong together, Flowable with its database with all kinds of other services that belong to the same logical entity. Um, the point is that communicating between those engines is or was actually sometimes hard. Of course, you've got REST, but you know it's not really an easy way to model this. What we've added now in 3.12 is something which we call event sharding. Uh, it basically allows you to have multiple independent nodes, clusters of global instances, and configure different uh, partitions on the same topic on different nodes. So I'll give you an example to explain that. You could listen on one uh, set of nodes of Flowable to a certain list of partitions on a topic. On another cluster, you could listen to another set of partitions. They could use this information then to send to same partitions or other partitions based on some algorithm, you know, round robin being the easiest or whatever you can you know, figure out. The point is that it's up to your configuration to determine which things belong together logically. And this allows you to really have a scalable way of handling your events in, you know, in extremely high throughputs. Uh, and there will be more information about that you know, after. So uh, for example, when I have now the customer identifier as my event key, then I could go ahead and say that one global instance is always processing everything belonging yeah. to that specific customer ID. For example, for example, so it's basically up to your you know configuration how to to do that. So we give you basically the tools to implement that, yeah. uh, but it's up to you to really uh, you know think about your architecture and and how you would you know, want to do this. But we give you the tools now to do this, so you know uh, there's no excuse anymore of not to do it. Yeah, I think that makes sense, and that's a really good feature for all our customers using Kafka and uh, when they would like to scale. So thank you for that one. Some of the new features are also around flowable control. One of them is mm -hmm. our bulk actions. Where can I use those? Yeah, well, I'm just going to show you Valentin. Uh, basically, many customers have asked us for things like mass reassignment. So in control 312, you can now go to, for example, in tasks, filter on the tasks like previously, and then you now can select multiple tasks, right? But and those execute. tasks don't need to be uh, somehow related. Those can no, just be- No, they don't, else. no. This you know, global uh, control is really administration tool. So you can do mm -hmm. low level changes here. As an admin, you can really change it. These instances don't have to belong, the tasks and the instances don't have to belong to the same definition and stuff like that. So I can just say they need to be reassigned to Valentin. And there you go. They're now bulk mm -hmm. reassigned to you. Um, nice. Another thing that customers have asked for is for jobs, in particular, mm -hmm. the dead letter jobs. So before it was really tedious, you had to select one by one, move them one by one. It took a long time to move them back to being executable. Well, 
That's that was now. really annoying when you have multiple. Yes, I know. Can, so I can now select these. Can I basically say, also just select all of those drops at once? Yeah, or? yeah. You can just do here at the top and select all of them. Okay. And I could say now move them, right? And they all will be moved now, become a, a executable job, uh, and you know continue as a normal asynchronous job. So yeah, you know, I think that kind of okay. highlights the new features in uh, control around bulk reassignment. That's really cool. And um, now I think there's also a new audit log. So whatever we have done now, can we see that there? Yeah, correct. So basically, if you go uh, down into configuration okay. and here, select audit log. OK, that's behind you, actually. But uh, I think the label is ah. just audit log <laughs> for that one. Huh? Yeah, it's called. It's basically states audit log. So you have to trust me on this. But yeah. you know, if you click it, you will come to this UI. And basically, it will show you all of the interactions that you had in control. When did you do it? What kind of data is in there? So really, you know, uh, gives you an overview of what has happened in control. That, that is really cool. And when I would like to have that external in another application, is there also right. an option? Uh, there is, there is. So basically, we have a set of interceptors, as we would call them. And these are Java interfaces. You can do whatever you want. So you can capture these uh, requests and then put them into any other external system that you like. Uh, that is that is awesome. Now, before with uh, Flowable until 3.11, it was always that I have two user groups, admin and non-admins. Admins, I right. think, were not able to do... Uh, non-admins were not able to do anything, uh, but admins are allowed to do something. Correct. Now, how is that Correct. with 3.12? Well, in 3.12, there's actually it's quite in a new uh, set of things you can do there, is there is a way to find grain control uh, or, you know, control, bad word here in this sense, uh, to kind of set what privileges this user has. For example, I created a test user before this demo. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I just, nothing particular around that, you know, just yeah. a general thing. And what you can then do in role management is actually is create actually, roles. That's actually, again, behind you. So it's role management oh, on the left yes, side. Yes, you have to trust me again on role management. Mm -hmm. There you can uh, create new roles. You can give them any name. I now mm -hmm. added my test user to it, but let me just show you how that looks like. So here I can change the privileges and there's a whole set of mm -hmm. privileges that we expose. Uh, in this particular case, the only thing, as you can see, is I gave access to the dashboard. And you can fine grained control what are the visibility of all the oh. different data bits in control are. There's a whole bunch of really mm -hmm. administrative Operations like re-indexing, yeah. migrating instances. There so are destructive we can operations. Still decide if the user is able to do something or just have a read-only view. But this time, that's, even that's on correct. a fine granular basis. Exactly, that's, exactly. Yeah, so let me just show you how this looks like. So now I didn't select anything except for the access dashboard. So mm -hmm. let me log out now. One sec, and okay. log in with test user test. Here we go. Mm -hmm. And you can oh. see that I don't have any access to any of the tabs in uh, control. Yeah. Now, this also works, of course, on the REST level, because this is not just mm -hmm. UI. So also on the backend level, these permissions are yeah. checked and validated. So you can't access data that you shouldn't be seeing or do any operation okay. that you shouldn't be uh, doing. I, I still see that you have configuration. Can you that change something or? Uh, no, 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 no. Just, 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 you know, the only thing I can okay, do is change my password, password. And, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I would that want to sense. do that, I would actually give that role, that privilege, that permission to this particular user. But yes. I didn't, I only gave the dashboard one. Yeah, That really makes sense. I think that is going to be useful for all our customers since uh, control is an admin application for everybody. Thank you, Jorn. I agree. So not completely related to flowable control, but you can nicely show it in flowable control is actually housekeeping. What is new in housekeeping with 3.12? Right. Okay. So indeed, it's quite hard to show or visually the changes that we've all done around housekeeping. So we've done a lot of efforts in the housekeeping logic to make it more performant, uh, to be able to clean up lots of historical data in an efficient way. Um, the housekeeping feature is not that uh, old. I mean, it, I think it was 3.11 or 3.10 that we've added it. And we've seen that pretty much all the customers have started using it. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of data that is being generated every day with Flowable. So it makes a lot of sense to make it as efficient as possible. Uh, obviously, I, obviously, I can't show you in control how this works efficiently. But what I can show you is kind of how it looks like. So what I did before 
this movie is I generate a couple of uh, instances and then I uh, let the housekeeping run with a small batch size uh, of only three. And you can see that, for example, here, if I go to the UI, there was actually a couple of parts that um, have been completed. For example, if I click here, what you can are see that those parts basically. So, what can we see? Actually good question. Those parts? Yeah, yeah, very good question. I'm going a bit too fast here. Uh, well, basically, what this shows uh, is that there's a sequential deletion of the data, of the historical data. Mm -hmm. So, the first part is actually calculating what needs to be done, and the next parts are actually implementing that delete. And this goes on. You have as many parts in batch until your data is basically fully cleaned up according to your uh, configuration. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of them, for example, this one shows that I've deleted these three instances in this particular part. So, so your so, batch size is basically three and you just have for yeah. each of them, then those split up. Yeah, obviously in reality, you want to have a way bigger batch size in a realistic system yeah. with millions of instances. You want to need a, going to need a bigger batch size, but mm -hmm. you know, just for demo purposes. Um, so yeah, that's it. I mean, there has been, even if you uh, have no other reason to upgrade to 3.12, but you're using housekeeping, that alone should be a reason to upgrade because we really improved performance and throughput significantly in uh, 3.12. And, and you actually can even see that the performance is pretty good since all completed show the same second for them. So at least for your scenario, it was completed. And always, you, you know, it worked. It always works on my machine. Yeah. <laughs> but as, as you mentioned at the beginning, people should just try it out on their machine Absolutely. and see basically how it goes. Uh, maybe download the enterprise trial in case you haven't done so. Exactly. Now we talked a lot about control and all that technical stuff which happens in the background. Do we also have something new in Flobo Forms? Yeah, obviously. I mean, there's a lot of changes in the form engine performance-wise and general fixes that we've done. Lots of you know UI fixes, uh, improvement in general. And there's a couple of components that are really easy to demo. So let me just show you what I mean with that. Uh, for example, on the left-hand side, you can see a new component here. This is the checkbox group. Mm -hmm. As the name implies, it allows you to select one or multiple options from a list of options. Uh, you know, I used here a static list mm -hmm. where basically I so the you can, there, can also use a REST yeah. API or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So if I would select here REST, I can actually hook it up with REST API from the back end. Mm -hmm. That would provide my values. can select them in the front end and then use them all in my case or process yeah. instance later on. Yeah. That, that's really cool. So I don't need to drag and drop four checkboxes anymore. I can nope. now go ahead and... Exactly. I mean, before you would have to use different checkbox components, make sure they're bound to the same value which is a nightmare when it comes you know, to maintenance and, and making a mistake. So this really is a component that will make your life easier uh, compared to before. Let me show you how that looks like. I mean, it's not spectacular, mm -hmm. right? I mean, as the name would imply, this group is rendered as a group and I can select one or more okay. items here. I, I can actually see whenever you change something there, yeah. that the number below that changes. What have you done there? Yeah, well, that's actually a good question. It's one of the most asked features in the form engine has arrived in 3.12, and that's the ability to listen to events of components and to mm -hmm. add expressions or behavior on top of that. So um, if you look here, the checkbox group has a configuration for events. Now, this is okay. new. I, I so, guess also other elements have that configuration and not only the checkbox. Yeah, you know, all of the elements have this exactly, exactly. So basically what I've done here is that whenever this value changes, I mm -hmm. am going to uh, make the number value one larger, basically, right? Mm -hmm. And the number yeah. value, you might have seen that, is bound yeah. to this value here. So that's why in the form at runtime, whenever I selected something right here, mm -hmm. it takes the current value and just adds it. And because that's bound mm -hmm. to the same value, that's why it, you know, it works. And obviously, this is a very simple example, but you can already see how this gets yeah. will be used a lot to do intercomponent kind of logic. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, you just have one more element here on that screen, the pick a value, basically the outcome. Yeah, or yeah the, actually or the two, there's one hidden. I'll, yeah, oh. I'll show you in a second, the second one that's hidden. Uh, this was the split button. So we already had support for button groups, but there is now mm -hmm. a new way to render them, as you can see here, as a mm -hmm. split button. And as the name implies, it basically allows you yeah, to render it as a split button, which is you know a common pattern in modern yeah. forms these days. That's and really the cool. last feature, if 
Thank you. And the last feature that we're, we I wanted to show you is mm -hmm. the um, one of the things that a lot of people have asked is that when you when you click the complete button or when you click mm -hmm. the outcome button rather that people want to show a new form using the mm -hmm. data that you know part of the data maybe that you've got in this form and you know ask putting a summary on there or or giving you are you sure to do this kind of pattern. So mm -hmm. what's possible now here in the in the outcomes is I have now one outcome called submit okay. and I've bound it. Yeah, I bound it to a confirmation form. Now I didn't put too that, much time in this. So that form you modeled as well then I guess. Exactly. I mean I didn't spend too much time on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just put a you know a text on there yeah. saying are you sure you want to continue? Um, and when I would now go to my form here and in the theory, button. you could also use the variables which you have in your yeah process. exactly so the data I shared between the yeah. the form and the model form so you could actually you know spend some more time than I did now make a summary do something with the data before you're actually submitting it uh, to the back end mm -hmm. um, Bef so before if I, you, you know, submit it actually ah yeah, yeah that's a really nice form can you select just yeah. maybe <laughs> in, in addition to coffee also for me a lemonade that I also have something yeah. to drink all right here we yeah, go. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So if I submit this now and I click submit. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I see where you're going to. You want to see how it's stored, right? Yes, the exactly. Uh, all right. So if I use inspect, for example, and check the variables, uh, you would see that the checkbox value, which is the mm -hmm. uh, uh, variable that I bound my checkbox group to, is actually stored as a JSON array. So, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's a very right. flexible way of working with this data, uh, both in front end and in the back end. That's nice. Then I can have, for example, a multi-instance later on iterating Correct. over it easily or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Those are yeah. pretty cool features for modelers or citizen developers actually to get started. Right. Now, looking at the release notes, we have a few to topics we haven't covered yet. That includes Java 17 support and also for Elasticsearch staying with the latest and greatest. So we have now an Elasticsearch 8 support. And in addition to that, since a lot of our customers are using AWS, we added OpenSearch support. So you can now also use as a search engine instead of Elasticsearch, OpenSearch. Obviously, since we added Elasticsearch support, you can still stick with that. Uh, being on the AWS side, we also added AWS S3 support. Right, and that's quite interesting uh, because that's a PR that you've done, Valentin. So maybe it's time to reverse this situation, right? So I can ask you, like, what does it mean for, for using the AWS S3 support? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Since uh, until 3.11, you had basically two options there. You could either store your content items. So whenever you have uploaded a document within your process mm -hmm. or in your case, as well as uh, through the document section and work uh, to either a file system storage where you need to have a network attached yeah. storage. So, so you're, you're like talking that. about, yeah, you're sort of, you're talking about, for example, this one here, right? If you upload a yes. file to this or in the forms, if I'm using an attached component, for example, where the yeah. actual bytes get stored, right? Exactly. And either you share them somehow between different pods when you are in a Kubernetes environment, or you go ahead and store them in the database. Mm -hmm. Both is not optimal for a cloud native setup. So I thought maybe it's nice to have an S3 storage integrated, which allows you to integrate with AWS S3 or any other compatible storage. For mm -hmm. Azure, we also did a blob storage integration, so you can even use it there. Cool. Now, um, looking at my list, we also have uh, the JSON type for the data object. Right. Uh, since right, we already yeah. talked a little bit about that in other videos, yes, I think it's gonna... back back on your side. Yeah, let me open up the data object here. I mean, it's it's a minor thing, but it's going to be used by that. Lots that of is actually people. based on the video you have done before. I yeah. Think, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's a series of videos by now. It started as a, you know, uh, as a first video, and I thought that's it, but it keeps growing. Uh, so who knows what we'll end up with. Uh, the JSON type support is actually quite easy in the sense that there is now a new type for the data objects fields, which is JSON. Now, with the uh, kind of advent of, of the JSON native support in many of the databases that we support, this is a very powerful feature. Many customers have asked to actually store 
uh, JSON natively mm -hmm. inside of data objects. So this is what that feature is all about. So when my database supports it, it will be a JSON type field and otherwise a string, I guess, or a blob. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, yeah. correct. Okay. Uh, anyway, that you might be able to configure then in your liquid base script. At exactly. The end. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. makes sense. Now, next on my list is actually about uh, sticking a little bit with services, since that one here is also bound to a service, but this more on the right. REST service side. So yeah, uh, yeah, then yeah. we also have a few improvements, I think, about yeah. storage of yeah. responses. Yeah, let me open up here. Is here's an example. Here we go. Uh, so this is a regular, you know, just quickly configured some uh, REST service here. This just some get. Uh, but that's not important. The most important thing is here around the output parameter. So uh, let me start with the one at the bottom first. Uh, this is a regular output parameter. When I open it, there's actually something new here. It basically says that I can store the full response body as JSON in the result variable. Mm -hmm. right? So this was uh, something quite powerful. So you don't need to map every field now. You can go Correct. ahead and say you would like to store everything yeah. at the same time. Yeah, obviously, exactly. Obviously, like before, you could still say, oh, it's actually a string or it's an array, and I can actually map it to, to you know something more structured. But if you don't have something structured, you could do it uh, this way. So that's for the regular output parameters. And then we have the one here. And that's a completely new one. So here, what I'm doing is I'm saying, this is the error output parameter. Mm -hmm. and. I'm actually using as a source the status code, right? So not the default, okay. which is just taking the body, uh, but I'm using the status code. Okay. And I can I, actually also see there are a few other new sources. So there are also headers in there now. Yes, similar like, you know, the body or, or whatever, right? You can get the information from the yeah. headers as many services out there, they put actually data into the headers, uh, often metadata, but often sometimes real data. Mm -hmm. And now we have a way to capture that and use it in your BPMAN and CMAN uh, models. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, OK, if this service has an error, a status code you yeah. know, with 400 or 500, which I'm saying here, I want to mm -hmm. actually map that to, to, to an error. right? Yeah. Um, and I can use it now. Let me, sorry, let me quickly go through a process that I prepared mm -hmm. for this purpose. So here I got a, a REST call, a service call, a service model call. Uh, and you can see there is now a new section. Mm -hmm. There is the regular output parameters, but there is also the error output parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can map these into my BPMN instance here. Whenever an exception happens here with one of the status codes, it will be captured. And this output parameter value will actually be stored as a variable now in my instance. That, that is really nice. No. It is one of, you know, something that, a lot of customers have yeah. asked for, so I'm really happy that we have it. I, I can really see that, how that is interesting since, I mean, the happy case is always easy, but mm -hmm. the unhappy case isn't that easy. Now, exactly. just to move forward in the list, since we have still a few topics to cover, um, we have uh, for the var expressions now also nested right. variable support. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, it is actually, you know, we have these uh, conditions that you can you can write, right? So I can write any kind of condition. And historically, when I was doing something like var get to get a certain value, I could write something like result dot customer mm -hmm. dot address dot street, right? Now the problem mm -hmm. before was that if one of these along the chain is null and null customer or address is null, the whole thing would actually stop executing. You would have to write mm -hmm. something more advanced, like, you know, uh, var exists result, mm -hmm. var exists customer, you know, quite complex. Now, yeah. in 3.12, this has changed. We actually now interpret these expressions differently in the sense that if one of these is not there, you don't have a customer, you don't have an address, mm -hmm. this will actually not stop you. It will give you an exception like it did before. Uh, so it's way more powerful to write simpler expressions in a much more you know, natural way uh, that you think about these things. And that you cannot only use for var get, you can also use it for yeah. get or default or equals. Exactly, so. exactly. It, it is implemented on the lowest level of the expression resolving, so it pretty much works everywhere, exactly. Now, next on my list, there are actually dynamic filters in work, but I'm not sure if we are able to cover that today since that is a really powerful yeah. and... Uh, yeah. complex topic as well, but maybe I can didn't prepare this some yeah. overview what it does. Yeah, well, it's actually pretty simple in the sense that uh, 
from a functionality point of view, it's adding new filters here dynamically, uh, which are then backed by a query, an Elasticsearch query, for example. Uh, and it allows you to add whatever you want here in, uh, in the list. Now, this probably is a good idea for a follow-up how-to movie. Uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with you. I will put that on my list. <laughs> uh, now, looking at this list here, I have only one more left. And uh, maybe when we go back to Flowable Inspect, since we are already right. in Flowable Work, uh, we have yes. now work definitions. Oh, yeah, uh, here, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, what can we do in those work definitions? And maybe how relates that also to uh, what we have seen before with the events? Yes, that's a very good point. So basically, this new definitions tab allows you to introspect definition models. If I would have timers here, it would show up. You could fire them. These would be start timers. Okay. Because before, ah. it was not easy to start them mm -hmm. right from the inspect. But interesting, I mean, we've talked about this mm -hmm. uh, a while ago in this movie, the event registry mm -hmm. here, I can actually use this to start and record a test instance. That, so I can capture really a test. Cool. Yeah. Exactly, because I can capture this test without, again, having to set up the whole Kafka infrastructure and build a repeatable test that I can do later and retry later to see yeah. if everything still works, right? So that's what this is about. So this really is, a, which we didn't have before, a way to, to start the, the instances of a definition by their you know, specific start types, you know, signal and, messages, timers, and stuff like that. And with that, you have the possibility to debug everything as well yeah. as have repeatable tests, which you could execute also later. Exactly, on. exactly. Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. That's a really nice feature. And actually, also, it's a pretty good end for today's movie. So thank you very much, Jorm, for joining today. No worries. Uh, I mean, there is way more than we've shown in the movie today. I mean, the release yeah. notes of uh, 312 is really long. We kind of picked the things that are easy to demo and interesting to demo. But have a look for yourself. Have a download of the trial. And yeah, let us know what I you think about it. I definitely learned a lot and I hope you also <laughs> learned a lot. So thank you very much for joining today and see you next time.